Welcome to the 202nd episode of News Dump, where we run through the hottest topics in the Lewis County news scene and discuss. I'm local man Aaron Vantile, joined by Chronicle Executive Editor Eric Schwartz, and we're joined in spirit by sponsor Summit Funding, Shayla's Outfitters, and The Roof Doctor. And we have a guest. Schwartz, would you like to introduce our guest? You didn't think I could find him, but I have found your former roommate, Owen Sexton, Chronicle reporter, yeah. to shame you for your living ways. I, <laughs> I was only with you for about two weeks, but... What's the most embarrassing thing he did during that time? Uh, Got nothing? Not really, to be honest. Uh, cleanly. I miss your dog. He was fun to hang around with. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> He's dead, Owen. <laughs> I can't believe you brought that up. Well, no one told me. This is the first time hearing of it. Damn, now I feel bad. Cool. Well, he was pretty old. I mean, he had a good run. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. your dog, man. <laughs> Survived getting hit by a car. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah, I forgot a, about that. Yeah, that was a, a rough time. Girlfriend ran him over. Ex-girlfriend, yes. yeah. <laughs> Ex-girlfriend. <laughs> he already looked like he'd been run over. That was the funny thing. Uh, yeah, he didn't really look all that worse for the wear, but he was pretty dinged up after that. Yeah, don't do Ralph dirty like that. No. Yeah, Owen, he, was a, he was a good boy. Owen covers city government. He's our business reporter. Uh, man, South Thurston County. You've been here for a couple yeah. years now? Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, uh, well... This is actually the first job I've had writing for a newspaper out of college. I went to Northern Arizona University in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, prior to that, I was working mainly as a bouncer and in kitchens, and before that, in the Marine Corps as well as an F-18 mechanic. I deployed uh, twice, once to Afghanistan and once on an aircraft carrier back in 2009. Well, thank you for your service. How does it make you feel that uh, Aaron uses the promo code veteran to get deals online on various services. I, <laughs> honestly, I don't even use them myself, so I'm happy someone's doing it. Oh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I got asked that. Like my, my parents will like, hey, do you ask for your veteran's discount? No, I forgot. Sorry. Uh, well, but more importantly, you're here today as the newsroom's UFO expert. Indeed, because, yeah, well, during my time in Flagstaff while I was attending NAU, I actually did see a UFO myself, and this past weekend, I also recently attended the Chehalis Flying Saucer Party. Well, let's start our news items with that, then. We'll jump around a little bit on the notes. Aliens invade Chehalis for the annual Flying Saucer Party. Hey, just a question for you as an editor. Do you think we need to have aliens in quotes there? Because in print, it went without quotes, and then I felt guilty. Yeah, I think it should be in. Well, they're not... Were there real aliens there? I mean, they were dressed like... There's no proof that there weren't aliens there. I mean, they blend in, you know? Well, if a bunch of people showed up in the newsroom dressed as children, but they were clearly <laughs> people, <laughs> would you be like, children, children aren't people? the newsroom. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Clearly go, adults. Go on, go you on. You know, it was a bad example. What do you... Anyway, no. I think it it is correct online. It should be aliens in quotes. My bad. There was about 600 people in attendance, and the theme of this year's event was Disclosure. Commemorates Chehalis pilot Kenneth Arnold's historic 1947 UFO sighting, where he saw some flying saucers on the way to Yakima. And I ask you, what red blooded Chehalin hasn't taken a work trip to Yakima only to be enticed by something shiny dancing in a circular motion that they can't explain to their wife? <laughs> I thought you were going to make an alien joke there. <laughs> <laughs> Caution you against it, sir. <laughs> What he saw came to be known as, quote, flying saucers after an East Oregonian article used the words saucer-like aircraft to describe them the day after Arnold's sighting. This was back in the day where you could just see something weird outside and they would literally put it in the newspaper. I'm a truther. I, I believe <laughs> Kenneth Arnold. How do you think that conversation went? Did he just like call his local newspaper or the East Oregonian be like, guess what I saw? And they're like, what? He's like, probably an alien. And they're like, oh, stop the presses. Didn't say it was probably alien. He said he did. Owen, what did he what did he say? Yeah, Owen, good go, go you can take over here. Tell us more about Kenneth Arnold. What do you know about the guy? He reportedly saw nine flying objects total flying between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams at speeds he estimated up to be anywhere. Well, some reports say twelve hundred, some say fifteen hundred miles per an hour. Either way, it was way faster than any conventional known aircraft at the time could fly in 1947. The sound barrier itself didn't get broken until later that year in October, a few months after Arnold saw his flying saucers. And I believe actually the East Oregonian reporter, they were waiting for him at the airport because yeah, he was flying to Yakima. He reported what he saw at Yakima and then word of it got down to where he was going to an air show in Oregon. And the reporters were basically waiting for there when he landed to interview him. Do you have, Schwartz, do you have a uh, like 
flight radio coverage Echo. reporter? No, like, I Owen, don't. Is that, well, it's kind of just... Owen. If it's like military related or flies, I'll usually send it over to Owen. I was going to say, I was an F-18 mechanic while I was in the Marine Corps. And so mm-hmm. I'm fairly familiar with anything that's in the sky. I'm not going to say I'm like <laughs> one of those guys that can identify like, you know, a specific type of Cessna, but yeah. more than likely I can tell what it is. I can tell it has conventional flight control systems, conventional power, you know. Yeah. Before we get to the speakers, tell us your, you mentioned that you, you saw a UFO. Tell us about that. You've told me before, but Aaron, Aaron would love to hear the story. He's, Go on. He's, he doesn't believe. I guess to get it on the record here. Yeah. And, uh, whether or not you believe me, that's up to you. Like I said, I'm, <laughs> I can't. Yeah. M effort. <laughs> All right, tell yeah. Tell, I don't have any physical evidence, here. and that's the thing. This is you know purely anecdotal. So, but no, nah, I was hiking. Uh, this is in 2016 in Flagstaff, Arizona. We were near the airport there, and we were out hiking in the woods. Admittedly, maybe not the most sober. We were partying. It was a mm-hmm. day off, having some friends out taking a hike in the wilderness, and we were just to the uh, north east of the airport, maybe about a couple miles away from it, but we were on the approach line, essentially, of all the aircraft as they come in. And I heard a Cessna flying, and being a former mechanic on jets, and also I was an airplane nerd growing up near an Air Force base in Arizona, I looked up, you know, as I always do, to check out what was flying above me and see. And looking through the trees, I was able to find the Cessna, but then lo Lo and behold, behind it, trailing, I don't know, I estimate maybe by a few hundred yards, was essentially, the best way I can describe it is it was, like, imagine a cylinder out of a geometry textbook. Like a, the Tic Tac everyone talks about. Is that what it looks like? Up, yeah. clo- well, up close, it didn't really have any rounded edges. Like, it looked like a solid, like, like I said, out of a geometry textbook, like a cylinder. And it was massive. I estimate maybe around 300 feet long, 75 to 100 feet wide. But it wasn't making a sound, and it was just trailing the Cessna as it approached the airport. And me and all my friends, you know, we're freaking out. Four-letter words are flying out, of course. What the f- is that? We're going crazy. I ran out to a clearing to try and get a better look of it because we're amongst all the trees still. But by the time I got there, again, without a sound, all you could hear was the Cessna flying still. This thing had disappeared under the horizon. And like you said, you described the little tic-tac. It appeared on the horizon danced around for maybe about 30 seconds before shooting up and disappearing straight up into the sky. Wow. Okay. That's a good one. That is at least what I saw. And yeah, I know there are people out there who claim, you know, people see things and mm-hmm. maybe we were all, cause I was out there with three other friends and we all saw it. And who knows? Maybe it could have been a group hallucination or, you just never I, know what it is, but I mean, a group hallucination where if you guys weren't doing shrooms or something, I, I've kind of, they're confident that you saw something. All right. From there, let's go to the flying saucer party. It was in Chehalis. You covered it. Uh, what were your, what were your takeaways? You also appeared in a promo video for this, didn't you? Uh, I did actually. Yeah. And like I said, with my story itself, I've been, this is now the third flying saucer I've been party I've been to. It was actually one of the first events I covered when I first moved up here two years ago. Mm-hmm. You've been to all of them then. Cause there's only been three, right? No, there was, oh, there was a the original one? one was in 2019 gotcha. before the pandemic. And that was before I moved up here. Gotcha. So I missed the original. I can't say I'm an OG, unfortunately, but yeah, I've uh, gotten to know the organizers pretty well and contact them and they issued or they emailed me and contacted me when they were creating the promo video earlier this year and asked if I would play a reporter quote who was asking Mayor Tony Ketchum about UFOs and he also played a part in the video as well and he played himself didn't he yeah yeah Mayor Tony Ketchum as Mayor Tony Ketchum I mean you know he played they, they, they typecast quotes. all of us pretty much I you know, a reporter <laughs> playing a reporter you know Mayor playing a mayor. I saw the good mayor was also in the parade on Saturday. He was. He was wearing quite the fun inflatable costume and had some uh, wild green hair. It was one of those costumes where it looks like the alien's carrying you away, but you're really inside the inflatable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was great. Uh, What was the most compelling speaker you saw at the Flying Saucer Party? For me, it was uh, Kevin Day. He is a retired U.S. Navy chief who spent 22 years serving in the Navy and deployed the total of six times. He didn't uh, get into the exact number of time, or he didn't know the exact amount of time he spent at sea while in the Navy, but it's estimated that he probably spent cumulatively years out there. And he was uh, involved essentially as a radar operator in the now infamous, like uh, Eric said, the Tic Tac video, which has been 
It's a video that's been recently disclosed in 2017 by the Department of Defense in which F-18 pilots track a tic-tac-shaped object on their FLIR radars and cameras as they fly, and they attempt to intercept it. It evades them. Basically, they're flying around, and yeah, these are military pilots who have thousands of hours of flight training. They're trained to identify things they see in the air and find out whether or not it's an enemy aircraft or anything like that, and they have no idea what they're looking at. And yeah, he was uh, on the USS Princeton, which is part of the carrier, the part of the carrier strike group that they were attached to. And he was witnessing these objects descend from space as he put them onto his radar screen. His radar screen, I think, had a ceiling he said of eighty thousand feet. And over a period of about ten days in two thousand four, during this training exercise off the California coast. Yeah, he said he witnessed around 100 of these objects come down from low Earth orbit, and then, yeah, they would disappear into the ocean. Okay, pretty good. And then subsequently, they went and talked to fishermen in the area. I liked that part as well, who said that that stuff's been happening all the time, and they were surprised it took them so long to come out and ask them about it, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, Luis Al- or, yeah, Luis Salazando, which I don't know if you're involved in the UFO community or you're into that at all. You've heard that name before. He's a former DOD official who used to actually work at the Pentagon throughout the 90s and 2000s investigating UFO reports made by military service members. And he has since left the DOD and essentially become one of the leading UFOlogists, as they call them, pushing for disclosure on the subject. And yeah, he interviewed Kevin Day talked to him about the incident, and Kevin Day, when he said these objects all appeared on his radar screen, he also mentioned that they all disappeared at the same exact spot, which, as Eric said, was about 60 miles north of, I can't remember the name of the island, but it was an island off the Mexican coast near the U.S.-Mexican border. And, uh, yeah, Luis Elizondo, he went out there and interviewed some of the fishermen, and they told him, at least reportedly, that they'd been seeing these objects. They would come down, enter the water without a splash, and they'd been seeing them for around a century as well. Hmm. And, yeah, they were surprised. Oh, why is no one coming out to talk to us about this until now? Compelling. Good stuff. He also seemed very credible, just as, as far as his background goes, it, like, He's talking about it not because he had an interest in it and found evidence. It just happened upon him. I thought that was cool. You wrote the first part of the speaker series. Who do we have on tap for Thursday? Uh, Yeah, aside from Day, you also had Charlton Hall, who spoke about his own experiences in the 70s actually making UFO hoaxes and pranking his neighbors and going down in history with the Alabama Metal Man, which is a known hoax that some people still believe in. You tell me they were able to fool people in Alabama? Right. Who knew now? (laughs) No, but uh, yeah, upcoming in this Thursday's edition, I am writing about uh, what was it? Steve Edmondson. He is a filmmaker up in Des Moines, near Tacoma, actually, who made a film in 2014 called The Maury, I- Maury Island Incident, in which he uh, documents Harold Dahl's alleged encounter, not only with flying saucers, but what is some considered to be the first encounter with the men in black. Cool. All right, next Aaron, item. Aaron oh, believes oh. it's it's all it's all BS, right? I believe everything's BS, especially if it comes from the government. I mean, this guy's not in the government anymore, though. But he was. The day guy. Mm. You think everybody just imagined it? I think anybody that works for a newspaper, the government is a phony. I find it so frustrating <laughs> as an amateur UFO enthusiast that for <laughs> years they said, you know, show us a video and then we'll believe. We get a video and then every, no one even knows about it. I think pretty sure my dad thinks I'm like having a manic episode or something because I was like, you didn't see the video? The New York Times published it? Like it was a thing? He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. The failing New York Times? (laughs) Well, the crazy thing is, even amongst his own fellow military service members, after the incident happened in 2004, Day said that he even faced ridicule from his fellow sailors. And, Mm -hmm. you know, people would joke about him and say they were crazy and seeing things. And it kind of led to them all, most of them, yeah, deciding either to remain silent about what they saw. But... Once uh, the pilots came out and the video was released, Dave then said, no, I've got to come forward and tell my story as well. I don't care what people think of me. And he actually did. I mean, the story itself, it did damage and affect his life. One, I didn't mention this uh, in my writing, but he told the audience and those in attendance that 
you know, his first marriage was destroyed because of this story. And his wife, first wife, actually almost attempted to kill him. What? Like, legitimately, like with the sword. She might have been the yeah. problem. With a sword? <laughs> with the sword. That's what he said, yeah. Hey, I feel like the aliens are the, the least interesting part of this story. <laughs> I feel like he was probably like, never mind. I'm not going to say it. Could he did, yeah. He, so he was it, just it, doing it something him. horrible. It's because of the aliens, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it, it affected him roughly, and it had a rough effect on his mental health. And oh, that's rough. Yeah, he said he almost lost everything be- because of it. But wow. all right, we can move on. But yeah, we'll have the second part of that story in Thursday's edition. The truth is out there. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll do some choose your own adventure here. Do you guys want to go fire or firefighters on this next one? Uh, let's go fire. Okay, <clears throat> I have good news, gentlemen. The Huckleberry Ridge fire is 100% contained. We did it. Mission accomplished. Good work. Thank God. Okay, that's enough of that. People in PL were starting to sweat when it got within 20 miles. The fire burned 300 acres. stayed within 20 miles. On Weyerhaeuser land, 20 miles south of PL. No structures have been threatened. The public is still asked to stay out of the area while crews continue to mop up the burned spots. A temporary flight restriction over the fire area is in place. Flight restriction, eh? What is big fire hiding from us? What really <laughs> happened on Huckleberry Ridge uh, is what I... You know what? The truth is out there. I think it just burnt up a clear-cut area. Uh-huh. I don't know. I, it's been a pretty decent fire season around here, right? Not too yeah. bad. It was a little yeah, rainy nothing, out there today. Too cool. Bad. So we had this, and then we had the other fire out a little closer to PL earlier in the summer. But aside from that, at least locally, just a lot of small fires. Yeah, thankfully. hasn't been that bad so far. So far. So far. But good job to the firefighters, and everybody appreciates their efforts. But I had a hard time with this fire just because you look at it on the map, and it's so far like removed from everything that it feels like, like who am I reporting this to? Like It is, yeah, it is as far away from PL as like Centralia is from PL. It just made me realize <coughs> how little I think about that bottom southwest corner of Lewis County, how I've never been there before. Yeah, I I don't know that I've been there before either. Maybe, I'm sure I have, but I'm telling you, we don't have recall. To, we have to suit up some journalists and send them down in kayaks on that East Fork Chehalis River I just learned about. That always goes well, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes. Next item. Just don't send any cameras with them. <laughs> no yeah. gear or kayaks. Fire District 6 Commissioner expressed concern about former chief's, quote, decision-making and judgment. These are also in quotes. Mm -hmm. Go back to your headline. Mm -hmm. uh, But not aliens, yeah. No. Fire District 6 fired Paul Patterson after less than a year of him being chief. Uh, Correction, he technically resigned. Uh, Yes. Under duress. Under duress. But he did write down, I resign on a piece of notebook paper that we we have acquired. In a meeting that he did not call. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, Now, retroactively, they're saying there were, quote, they were, quote, concerned about his decision-making, management skills, judgment, professionalism, and communication style, and considered a motion to terminate him before he resigned. Greg Green, the fire district commissioner, quoted via a letter in this story, said he was willing to fire him before he resigned in a meeting that, uh, as I just said, Patterson did not call. His resignation letter, that should also be in quotes, was nine words long and scribbled on scrap paper. He is considering a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought this was really worth just not having a fire chief again. Yeah, I don't know. It's not really retroactively saying they were concerned about decision-making, judgment, professionalism, things, because he did have a review that we also got and did not score above satisfactory on any of it, um, according to the fire commissioners. But then there was also like a clash with him and another uh, employee of the district at one point that preceded this. It it was kind of messy. Again, every time the topic comes up, I just have to say he was very professional, courteous, and helpful in all our interactions. He sure seemed like Cody liked him. Yeah, he, seemed, he was nice to Cody. Are you just saying that because Cody took his picture while he was putting those fires out? Yeah, and Cody was like, yeah, he was cool. He was like, hey, you're going to put us in the paper? Cool. He's a really nice guy. That's what yeah. I've been told. Cody kind of thinks everyone's nice, though. Yeah, he's like a puppy dog. Yeah. Bit of a yeah, golden retriever. I suppose so. That's true. All right, next item. I can't believe he ditched us to go swimming today. I know, with Zach of all people. <laughs> the weather's not even nice. No. I assume no. they're swimming indoors, but. Yeah, he's, who knows? I think he's out of Mayfield Lake with the boys. You know, that's another thing. Why don't they have swim meets outside? I think they should. That's yeah. actually a very, that might be the best point you've ever made on these 202 episodes of this <laughs> podcast. 
Just do it in China Creek. Yeah, it's not a natural has a pool. lane. There. You know, we have rivers. Just swim across the river and back. There you go. Yeah, add some variables too, like muskrats and lamprey. Like, yeah, you don't you know, know when Mother Nature's going to jump swimmers, in there. Swimmers, kayakers. I like that idea, Aaron. That's the a good police one. showing up to the kayak know, man. Go yeah, the yeah. kayak man. Uh, I just had an idea with Franklin and Kyle today that we need to put together a suicide squad of local criminals. Uh-huh. So far, we have the kayak man, mm-hmm. the IT guy from Centralia. City oh, yeah. Hall. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's all we got so far. I, what about two dogs? Uh, oh, boy. A little too violent. <laughs> it's a little too violent. Uh, that's not, he's not a, like a super villain. He's just a villain. No, we were. Just, we did get stuck on like the heavy because you don't want like an overly violent heavy, but you do need an enforcer of some sort to go along with your IT guy and aquatics expert kayak I mean, man. Do we have like a like a top-notch embezzler they could go after? Someone suggested the guy who keistered all those drugs into Lewis <laughs> County Jail. Uh, oh boy. Was not accepted. Maybe um, the, uh, I was going to say, Morton's former clerk slash treasurer. Who's oh, yeah, just to acquire the proper financing. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are you they go. going? Then we got are financing. They... We've, got, we've got IT. Yeah, are, well, if you're doing, are you throwing Morningstar on this team too? Like, uh, I don't think we need a sexual harasser. <laughs> no, he did other crimes no as pra- well. So practical, effective that. Oh, all right. The next item: Napa Vine residents concerned over the impact of proposed housing development. There's a development coming to just outside of Napa Vine with about 195 houses, and the people are worried where all the traffic and whatnot is going to go. So they held a meeting about it on Thursday. The meeting was organized by residents, and it included comments from representatives from the school district, the PUD, and the fire department, and they had to have written comments in by Monday for all this. Nobody from the city showed up, and nobody from the development showed up. Face the public, you cowards. It did seem a bit aggressive. They had their names uh, like they're on the stage so people would know who was speaking, and they mm-hmm. just marked it out. Someone had a giant red Sharpie for I some saw that. reason. I like that. Good. Yeah. We know those people weren't all at a football game because Napa Vine played Saturday at Stadium High School, Got as covered in the Chronicle. <laughs> Got him. Shane Schutz, Napa Vine superintendent, also girls basketball coach, said about 195 kids would be a notable influx. That's just an estimate based on. Don't you have to note houses. that Shane is a state champion every time his name comes up? He's a state for champion for at least the next five years. Yeah, state yeah. champion guy. You know what? We said the same thing about Gary Stamper every time his name came up. Shane shoots. Yeah, you got to. State champion. Uh, yeah, he said that would be a notable influx and would certainly change things at the school. Greg Peterson, one of our many interim fire chiefs, said it wasn't that big of a deal as far as the fire district was concerned. And the beauties, Luke Canfield, said population growth has nothing to do with electricity. Our static indifferent God. <laughs> and it was the big difference for them either. <laughs> it did not. That's the important issue. However, the people remained feisty. Woodard is not built for all this traffic, one attendee said. If you're looking at 195 houses, you're probably looking at a minimum of 400 cars. Sure, because it's impossible to be an adult and own a home and live in it alone. Check your privilege, (laughs) commenter. (laughs) Napa Vine did debate putting in impact fees on new developments and new housing years ago, back when I was an education reporter. Flexing. Never did. I just remembered that. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, and impact fees. We talked about it. We've been here before. Uh Uh-huh. You guys should have pulled the trigger way back when. Time is a flat circle. It is. Yeah, the school has been trying to pass a bond for quite some time to create some more space, and um, it sounded like the funding they would get for education from the state for this would be enough for one additional modular building. Oh, good. Yeah. Did you get any education in, mod- in a modular building? Um, we didn't have any when I was in high school, no. Because our school was relatively new then. It was like four or five years old. Mm. I and took so, my uh, government and my mock trial classes in a modular classroom, actually. I attended fourth grade in a modular classroom. Oh, I was I attending mean, a I, Christian school in North Carolina, mm-hmm. and it broke off into a new Christian school, as they often do. And the new one was complete modulars. And wow. they put out a contract for lunch that year, and McDonald's won the contract. <laughs> so the cafeteria was staffed by McDonald's, except on Friday. We got Little Caesars. Wow. Got to have pizza. <laughs> exactly. Imagine going to a private school and you show up and it's a trailer. Uh, it was rough, man. I'm not going to lie. Was it at least a... Di- no, I'm not going to say it. I'd probably be successful if not for my fourth grade experience. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, that's what's uh, going on with Napa Vine. Next item, Centralia City Council holding a special meeting to interview a special council candidate. 
The candidate is Norm Chapman, who's on the planning commission. I don't know why that was buried so deep in the story and not in the headline. How dare you? I mean, We're both a, sitting right here. You're throw in the goddamn us? headline. What are you guys doing? They're interviewing him tonight. Owen, why are you here? It was a short story to begin <laughs> with. <laughs> it's a brief, man. Uh, one of the questions will apparently be, say you're at dinner with your friends and the bill comes and you all check your pockets and realize you're <laughs> short, oh, let's say $1.1 million. <laughs> what would you do? That would be that the, the most res- respectable move of all time if the Centralia Council purposely hired like a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think those are just floating around Centralia. <laughs> what do you think about our current stormwater system? Are you happy with the police? Can we have $1.1 million? <laughs> those, are the, those are the questions. So, yeah, which kind of, I had only noted it here, but Centralia does have a $1.1 million budget deficit looming. They're considering tax increases or cutting services, which is what you do when you have things like that. Oh, and what did they say they were going to cut if they had to do cuts again? It was police. Over my dead body. (laughs) Probably literally. Over someone's, apparently. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, the police and then the water and streets departments. Those are where the cuts are going to be made, which Mm -hmm. they also said had already been cut. In previous years. When Parks budget too, right? Leave. Parks is cut back? Or? Parks as well was the yeah. other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Are you going to support these new taxes, Aaron? I don't know. i got to read more into it. What if they uh, don't cut the police, then the police park on your lawn again? I Well, I don't know. Well, I'm still, not going to be happy about you're it. You're still upset about that. There was uh, I No, I'm not. The, I will go. I'm going to jump ahead to Facebook comments of the week because... The commenters had some things to say, and one of the comments I liked was somebody saying, you ever notice cuts are only to public-facing and servings departments? And somebody replies, probably because these public-facing services are 80% of the budget, which is true. The police and fire yeah, police is, are a yeah. massive chunk of the budget. Police, yeah. And then At least people, half, yeah, people kept replying, I'd be curious to see an actual breakdown, and then somebody would link in the comments to the PDF of the actual breakdown, and then nobody would comment further, so I just assumed they didn't <laughs> read it. <laughs> or they I did, made sure to link on. past budgets in my own story, but well, people are people concerned read those about out. that. Anyway, thoughts on the budget deficit and Norm Chapman, who is a billionaire who's going to save the budgets. I don't know if I ever said he was a billionaire. I did say he was on the planning commission, still is. But oh. uh, Schwartz, thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, they're talking about a new business and occupancy tax, B&O tax, not to be confused with body odor, Aaron. Mm-hmm. And what was the other one? Raise the city's uh, property tax would be the other one. Oh, I don't like that. I, I thought you might hate that. You don't have a business or occupation, so you don't have to worry about that one, at least. No. Um, but no, I don't know. it seems like they need the money, Aaron. Yeah. Property taxes are always a big issue, though. And yeah, the one thing with this tax increase is I guess they do have the option to raise it, or they have had the option to raise it basically all in the past years and just been banking it. Continuing that's, to uh, cut. Yeah, that's a popular move for city councils here in conservative Lewis County, at least traditionally it has been. In my experience covering the Shahala City Council, it's a competition to see who can shout out no first, but they all shout no. Well, Morton City Council did that. They banked $950,000 in uh, off, off-site uh, <laughs> accounts, right? Yeah, they're going to Over re- the last 10 years. Should they recoup that? All right, it might take last, a little while, but... Yeah. The risk pool. That's what will do it. <laughs> last item, Lewis County raises concern over cost of new public defender requirements. County commissioners are upset they have to pay the bills for things like, quote, providing constitutionally mandated legal representation. I think they were more upset that the the legislative fix in this case is addressing a problem Lewis County specifically does not have. Uh-huh. More so than what you just said. Okay. Well, now there's a new rule about not overwhelming public defenders with too many cases, and it'll be expensive to pay for enough public defenders... Wait until they realize how expensive it is to charge people for the crime of being homeless. If only people, dozens of people, had warned them about such things. No one's doing that, Aaron. It is an issue, though. I'm not Mm -hmm. saying, I'm just saying it's not so much an issue here. Uh, Yeah. But, like, you see it a lot from, I see it in the Oregonians' coverage a lot because they have a serious shortage of public defenders and also, like, Benton, Franklin County over near, like, the Tri-Cities where they'll let people out because they don't have an attorney for them, which I agree is probably the right thing to do unless you go down a really slippery slope of just locking people up, which we totally do for sex offenders in the state, but no, but no one else, uh, only the really bad ones. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is like an issue, and you see people that are like in jail for a violent crime, they get let out because they don't have an attorney, and then they commit another violent crime. Yeah. But uh, yeah, more or less, I, I thought the takeaway was, you know, it's not really something that affects them, and maybe it shouldn't have been across the board, but it is an issue. 
We have a quote from the story that says, implementing these reduced caseload standards without corresponding state funding would force us to make difficult choices. In the worst case scenarios, we would be forced to cut critical programs, reduce staff, or even limit services that our community depends on, said Commissioner Sean Swope, who's paid six figures a year to make difficult choices about cutting critical programs, reducing staff, or even limiting services that our community depends on. And I think all three commissioners were quoted in this news release, which I think is the lengthiest news release I've seen from Lewis County, like mm-hmm. period. It was like three pages. Well, they hate when the state tells them they have to do something the Constitution also tells them they have to do. No, it's just not that. I, I wish things were as simple as they are in your brain, Aaron. Way ahead of you, said <laughs> Sheriff Rob Snaza, whose plan for avoiding paying public defenders is to rarely turn in enough admissible evidence to charge a case. Well, that's also not in the story. <laughs> Little piece of commentary there. <laughs> Just so people don't forget. Uh, any other news items you guys want to discuss? There was something on the Centralia turf installation at Fort Worth Park. Maybe it's more expensive than they thought. Uh, it wasn't that interesting. Uh, it's not that it's more yeah, expensive. Owen wrote just... that. Why do you just keep shooting shots at Owen over here? It. The, the He's story, a guest. It was my first time on the, the topic. Yeah, the topic guess. wasn't that exciting. It wasn't like, oh, my God, we realize turf is actually super expensive and not, you know, it's just concerns over the increasing costs and they might get audited over it well the issue is just they're purchasing more than they originally attended they're yeah. going from turfing just the infields to fully turfing the fields so well that i don't agree with totally surprising <laughs> that that would happen over there yeah <laughs> uh any other news items you want to hit before we uh lewis county 4-h competitors specifically in the swine department you know i don't like to curse much but they kicked ass at the washington state fair Told they dominated the competition. I'm told that uh, in your mind, 4-H, never mind. I, I Thank you. I don't know where <laughs> you're going with that, but if you stopped yourself from being inappropriate, then I know that it was really inappropriate. So it's a lot of, lot of results. Didn't want to have to edit there. it out later. Ah, I, we never edited anything out. <laughs> well, that time, that time Justina told everyone about Pete's fleas, we did. Mm. Pete it got was, fleas it was, once. It was bed bugs, I think. Uh, yeah, maybe it was uh, fleas. Maybe it was fleas. I don't think it was bed bugs. Hey, can we bugs. take a break? Uh, sure. If you don't want to hear about the more news, I'll just I'll just no. I'll just do it at the end. Okay, fine. Hi, this is Jeff and Julie from Fairway Lanes. Jeff and I met Jacek of Summit Funding at our bowling center. So when we fell in love with this community and it was time to relocate, we knew we would be calling Summit Funding. They understand that everyone has a unique situation when buying a home. He had already helped two of our employees get into their own homes. The Summit Funding team exceeded our expectations. It was a seamless experience with great communication from his whole team. Thank you to Summit Funding for making our buying experience special and memorable. All right, we're back. Owen is still with us, right? Barely. Okay, yeah, he's there. It's time for segments. Segments are relatively short this week. Can I get get one last piece of news out of the way first? Do you want the 4-H joke on record? Uh, No, no, I do not. Thank you again for showing some (laughs) restraint there. I appreciate it. Did you know that right here in the Twin Cities, we have the second largest women's Carhartt shop in the world? I did not know that. Do you know where it's at? Is it at Shayla's Outfitters? It's at Shayla's Outfitters. Wow. Where's yeah. the first largest? I don't know. Okay. I wasn't even curious, though, because we have the second largest here. That's I'm quite sure a it's bit. Not, like, much bigger. Yeah. And also, if we talk to Kelly, the store manager over there, I think we should push her to make, like, the entire inventory women's Carhartt. Now, so when you say the spot. second largest Carhartt Outfitter for the uh, repeat that phrase again. Second largest women's Carhartt shop in the world. So is this a shop for the second largest woman that wears Carhartt? No, no. Okay. I really hung up on that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's 1,100 square feet of women's Carhartt clothing. More products, more colors and sizes, a huge selection. Uh, I really suggest that specifically if you are a woman, <laughs> you go down there and you take a look. And if you're not a woman, maybe you're a... Maybe you're a, f- a f- they also have Carhartt for men, too. Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, but maybe you're a bit of a philanthropist and you also like boots. A philanderer in boots? <laughs> Philanthropist. Point them my way. <laughs> uh, the big uh, Give Hunger the Boots sale going on through tomorrow. If you go get yourself a pair of Georgia boots, they donate, donate a portion of the proceeds to the Lewis County Food Bank Coalition. That's great. Where can I find Shayla's Outfitters? You can find it uh, right there <laughs> in the, the meaty part of the Twin Cities. Is it North National Avenue? I think it's North National Avenue. Yeah. Yeah, you can find it right over there. Everybody, Everybody knows, knows where, where Shayla's, Shayla's Outfitters, Outfitters is. Yeah. I do like that anytime I share news from Shayla's Outfitters, somebody jumps in the comments. It's like, it'll always be sunbirds. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. 
it was really a masterful like tr- like change in their branding, like how they kept Sunbirds for a little while and then just kind of got smaller, and then yeah. eventually it was just gone. <laughs> and Shayla's Outfitters, Shayla's Outfitters. It was really how long well done. Did they changed the name anyway. Uh, a couple of years ago, they got bought by uh, the company out of Shelton that has a similar store up there, mm-hmm. and they changed the name then. Okay, Shahila's uh, Outfitters. Check them out if you are a large group of women looking for Carhartt clothes. Yes, definitely that. Or if you need a good pair of boots and you also want to feed the hungry. Yeah. All right. Great. Good. Good, good intro. Good. I was for trying you. to get it get 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 it out there early. We always save Shahila's Outfitters for the end. I feel like we're doing them a disservice. Yeah, but they're great. Not everyone listens to the whole show, Aaron. That's true. Some people only want to hear my takes on the news, and then they tone out. I should put timestamps in just for you talking about Shayla Outfitters. You should, so people can go directly to it. That's a really good idea. You got two really good ideas today, Aaron. Two, yeah. All right, Tales from the Takes page. Julie McDonald has a column. Evening with Authors raises more than $4,000 for the Hope Alliance. A worthy cause. I can't believe no one from the Chronicle's editorial staff was there to be a speaker. Yeah, it was pretty embarrassing. Uh, Julie McDonald also hosted the Southwest Washington Writers Conference that oh, same that's weekend. that's the one. And I was supposed to come there, and I had it on my calendar, despite having published three or four, maybe even five news items about it for the <laughs> following weekend, and I did not go. So, And the worst part about it is Julie's so nice that she did emailed, and she didn't chide me for not being there. She thought that something was wrong. She asked if everything was all right with me and my family. Oh, well, that was nice of her. Made me feel even worse. Yeah, I bet Because everything was totally fine. I was just at home. <laughs> I didn't do anything fun or anything. <laughs> You're just sitting at home watching Eastern football and crying. I think I was with you at O'Blarney's that day for a moment or two. That doesn't sound like us. No, it doesn't. But for this one, Centralia College English instructor Matt Young moderated the hour-long conversation. I think Matt Young's a published author, too. Uh, Garth Stein, the author of The Art of Racing in the Rain, was there. And Olivia Hawker, who wrote One for the Black Word, One for the Crow, was there. Uh, Young, yeah. He wrote Eat the Apple, a memoir. I think I read that. It's pretty good. You did not. I did. I have a copy of it on my shelf. I don't believe you. My mother gave it to me. Uh, we've had a lot of letters in the last couple of weeks. A lot of well-reasoned, well-researched letters, Go, mind just, you. Just throw the headlines at me. Uh, 911 measure is essential for the safety and well-being of residents and visitors. Debatable. Punish Trump by making him a loser. Debat- Go on. Your wallet and purse won't lie to you while you decide who to vote for. My wallet and purse lie to me daily. Uh, Trump's refusal to condemn Putin concerning. Mm-hmm. We have uh, advocacy for cardiac catheterization services for Lewis County. Really running the gamut here. Cardiac, what? Never Those mind. Those are important. Yeah. Anyways, those are the major ones. I've got another fresh batch of letters that'll run in the Thursday edition. A lot of good ones in there. A lot of bangers. All right. <clears throat> and then you got to mention Mitke. He had a nice column on Bill Moeller as curtain drops. One more ovation for Bill Moeller, uh, who passed away last week. I'm surprised that wasn't on your news items, but maybe I have it's on your hero of the week. Champion of go. the week. Yeah, I was going to roll those two together. But yeah, you know Bill Moeller pretty well. Tell us a little bit about him. Uh, Bill Moeller's great. Bill Moeller would come in here all the time. He died at the age of 96 after taking a fall about a week prior to his death. Um, but man, that guy was driving like to the age of at least 95, and yeah. he was coming in here. Uh, he wrote his last column last year after, I want to say, five times he told me he was done writing columns, and I'd, we'd have the same similar conversation. Where it's like, all right, Bill, we really appreciate your time and your effort, and everybody loves your columns, um, t- letting him know it would be okay. And then, sure enough, I'd get another column that next week. Um, but eventually he stopped, and so he did retire. But he wrote over 700 columns during his time here. Brian Mitke actually brought him to the Chronicle. He noted in this column. Um, and yeah, just a super interesting guy. Yeah, he was a longtime Mark Twain impersonator. Yeah. And yeah, he was a... What, which war did he fight in? Korean War. Korean War. Was he like a paratrooper? He was a paratrooper. Mm-hmm. Became a pilot at like the age of 70, I want to say. It was in his in his 70s. Former uh, mayor of Centralia. He was actually Centralia's last strong mayor before the council type system mm, that we have yeah. today. Um, and yeah, that's just like, I feels like it's barely scratching the surface. He's, he's had his finger in just about everything around here. Seminary Hill founding. He was in on that. Um, as you said, he was a Mark Twain. I don't know if impersonator is the right word, but yeah, he dressed up as Mark Twain and traveled yeah. around and did performances. <laughs> we had uh, Dennis Shane, our well-known letter writer, bring in three copies of his last performance of Mark as Mark Twain, mm-hmm. uh, and noted that he cried while watching it the day after his death. So I thought that 
that was moving. I haven't been able to watch it yet because on account of I don't have a DVD player hooked up anywhere. Was it on DVD or VHS? Uh, it's DVD. Okay. But uh, uh, Mickey was talking about maybe uploading it and we can get it on the Chronicle page. Oh, that'd page, be cool. Which I think would be neat. But yeah, Bill Moeller, great guy. Cool life. Yeah, he did a lot of stuff, a lot of interesting stuff. He was always He was always up to something. It was nice timing, too, because uh, we had discussed doing it for many years, but it was actually Coralie Taylor, uh, 99% positive for her idea, but he was our person of the year in 2024, so we were able to get him on the record. Isabel Vanderstoop, our former assistant editor, interviewed him and kind of got to encapsulate his full life in that story and uh, surprise him with that when he was in Sharon Care at the time. And he said he was completely caught off guard. And if I have to give Corley and Chad a little more credit, too, because even after Bill stopped writing columns for us, they kept him on the on the columnist payroll. Good. Um, he'd come by and get his check. If he didn't come by and get his check, Corley would go find him and deliver his check to him. And I thought that was a really nice move by them, especially since there was a time <laughs> when we faced budget constraints. Told Bill we can only afford two columns a month, so just write two columns a month rather than four. And he listened, said he understood, and then just kept writing four and getting paid for two for yeah. a couple of years. So kind of made that right. I appreciate the Taylors doing that. All right. From that, we'll segue into another ad read. Schwartz, how was your roof? Oh, why don't you ask Owen? Owen, oh, how, how was your roof? How was your roof? Well, it's not leaking, so that's okay. good. Good, good. Does it uh, does it have any signs of wear and tear? Have you ever thought, like, I wish I could get a new <laughs> roof on this house, but I'm really concerned because the cost of an estimate might be too much for me if I don't end up needing a new roof. Are you going to recommend I go see the roof doctors? <laughs> if I We're going to recommend you give them a call or at least visit theroofdoctor.com where you can get a free estimate. Because right. if you're wondering if your roof is under the weather, the roof doctor will have an answer for you. They have all of your family or business roofing needs covered. From new roofing to repairs, cleaning, and emergency jobs, their expert crews will get the job done and make sure your roof has a clean bill of health. You can also give them a call at 360-736-0246. That's the roof doctor. And so, yes, our People's Champion of the Week was Bill Moeller, and now our Sirens Banger of the Week I just appreciate a good Sirens Roundup headline. I do my best. They just throw a few of the interesting ones in there. Man arrested after calling 911 more than 70 times. Semicolon. Customer grabs employee, comma, kisses her multiple times. Semicolon. Arrest for eluding, comma, DUI. The one I focused on was a male customer at a business on Northwest Louisiana Avenue, (coughs) Walmart, was arrested after he allegedly, quote, grabbed an associate and kissed her multiple times. You know, this would just be the start of a rom com in the fifties, which is just, not a which is not a good thing. Not Aaron. a good thing. Just some mild sexual harassment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like assault, isn't it? You <laughs> grab her and kiss her. Yeah, that's assault. Yeah, there was not limited details on that one though. We don't get a whole lot. Like Shale's police are really good about giving us their logs, but they don't yeah. do a narrative. Like Centrea police provide a narrative. Um, so that one, yeah, I don't know anything beyond that. That was the report to the dispatcher. Okay, well, you know, hopefully they're. So here's the question, Aaron. Why'd you do it? <laughs> In Walmart, Why? sir. What? Are you saying Walmart employees can't be attractive? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying I don't shop at Walmart. Could you? <laughs> That's my alibi. I don't shop there. An elitist, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I got to admit, I, I haven't been there in many years. It's because Shales Outfitters has everything I could possibly need. Yeah. You buy your groceries there. You live entirely on beef jerky and popcorn. <laughs> And guns. And guns. Uh, Facebook comments of the week. Comment on an ad in a football story. This commenter says in all caps, stop football. It is foolish and dangerous. It almost reads like a poem. Then on a Napavine football story, the same commenter. Someday. Concussion. Sad. This reads like the, the writer is concussed. <laughs> it could be. On a WF West football story. Just stop football. It is dangerous. Maybe they're a former football player. Yeah, I think could be. I yeah, was going to... conversation to be had there. They're not, yeah. like, completely <laughs> off base with this assessment. Yeah, they're not wrong. They're just kind of, like, what... Do you think, just being do you a think, bit of a killjoy? Do you think Roger Goodell is going to read the Facebook comments on the Chronicle story and be like, God, you know what? It's time. Yeah, I don't know. I always wanted to play football as a kid, and I played football, and I can remember getting hit so hard that I literally went cross-eyed. It happened at Tenino. Like, I went cross-eyed, went to the sideline, didn't think I would ever see straight again. <laughs> Eventually, it came too. And in that mind, I have never encouraged my son to, either of my sons, one's a baby, so it doesn't really count, but to play football. I'll be 
perfectly fine if they never ask to play football. Yeah. My but own mother. I also yeah. love football more than anything <laughs> sports wise. <laughs> Same because my own mother raised me to be a huge football fan. She's from, well, she was raised in Cleveland herself. So Cleveland Browns fan. I grew up, even though the Browns didn't exist for a while, I became a Packers fan, but I still cheat for the Browns. But she actually never let me play football growing up because my older brother, he did play football and he got knocked out during a game yeah. once. And after that, she said, I'm never letting any of my kids play football. It was still really weird how she raised me to be a fan. And then <laughs> I was pissed off as a kid because I never got to play. But, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, you had your best, your, your, your health out in mind. I remember the. I still got some concu- concussions in the Marines. Don't worry. Oh, good. But, yeah. As long as you got that. I mean, who hasn't had a good concussion? Right. Uh, the quarterback my senior year at Forks High School got concussed on the sidelines, and he I, he didn't know where he was at. I was standing there, and he was trying to fight the paramedics that were trying to help him. <laughs> just didn't know where he was at. And they fed him a bunch of, like, Powerade, uh, trying to get him fluids, you know? Mm-hmm. From that day forward, if he sipped Powerade, he threw up. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was like some weird brain association. So, anyways, yeah. I and mean, The commenter is not too far. Oh, good thing Powerade's field. not a sponsor, but... Yeah, yeah. yet, yet. I have the same reaction to rum for different reasons. Uh, uh, another comment on a live feed of the Alien Fest in Chehalis. Ooh, it's Owen's video. Right. Yeah, this commenter said, why don't you cover the conflicting versions of history shown by the murals in the library park? What about the Soviet-style propaganda mural on the second floor of the antique mall? Explain those things, and you can have all the stars you like. <laughs> I mean, we literally had a front page <laughs> diagram of that uh, mural at the park that they're talking about where we identified ourselves as the pig spewing shit in the bottom yeah. right corner. Mm-hmm. We're like, this is the chronicle, according to the artist. <laughs> uh, apparently, we weren't great on our, we weren't very balanced in our Centralia tragedy. See, I caught that, Owen. I didn't call it the massacre uh, coverage. In case well, any IWW members are listening. It's just, it's just a, uh, the comments are always funny to me. It's like, I have not seen you report on this in the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, you cowards. I started following your page earlier this afternoon, and you don't have enough stories that I like. <laughs> and a, a comment on a story about another dead body found in the Gifford Pinchot Forest. This commenter said, I remember a time when there was actually laws against this kind of thing in Washington. I'm pretty sure that murder is still illegal. Yeah, they found a third one. This is down on the south side of the Gifford Pinchot, but all things Gifford Pinchot are local to the Chronicle, as you know. Yeah, this was Scamania County. Yeah, but yeah, it's a third one over the weekend, the third set of remains. And I think most of them, I mean, I can't say most, there's three of them, but they were talking about mushroom pickers, people that just went missing going out there. I don't think that there's been any uh, foul play. Foul play, yeah, but... Who knows? We've done a story before, and I, I was thinking we should do it again on the number of people who are missing in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. It is a larger-than-you-would-think number. 20? Oh, it's a good place to go get, like, lost. 30? Oh. Good thing it's in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can go get lost out there anytime you like. Right don't, don't do it, though. <laughs> also, stay away from Wallet Blake. <laughs> Noted. Yeah. It's, a, it's a hot spot for heart attacks, I'm told. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What uh, what what news did I not hit that you wanted to get in there? Oh, I think you hit the highs and lows of it. I already got the swine champions from the Washington State Fair in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see what else is on the Cron Line. Rainier High School is introducing its inaugural marching band. That's at Cron Line right now. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Thurston County family, this is from the Olympian, was at home when they discovered a man in the closet. The guy in the house saw some dirty footprints leading to the closet, went to the closet, and a guy came running out of it. Should be mm-hmm. a little upsetting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do that to your house just for just for gigs one of these days. Yeah. You're yeah. going to be, yeah, you're going to be hiding in the closet, huh? <laughs> in uh, my well, house. I walked right into that. <laughs> uh, Toledo Middle School student to be removed from school after making an unfounded threat Tuesday morning. Good. Uh, fentanyl was smuggled into the Lewis County Jail or was attempted to be smuggled into Lewis County Jail via an, an orifice. I'll let uh-huh. you guess. <laughs> Probably the ear. Um, and then let's see what else we didn't talk about. The lawsuit against the Centralia School District for that Oakview kindergartner down in our neck of the woods on yeah. the Launch Prairie. They were putting him in an isolation room, allegedly. Um, he had some behavioral social problems. Um, and teacher just told the mom one day, yeah, the day went great. We didn't even have to put him in the isolation room today, which is illegal. He can't do that. Yeah. Um, so that there had been a summary judgment in the case, but that has been reversed. And so the lawsuit is back on. Okay. Um, lots of other good news on Cronline. Let's go check it out. All right. Uh, Owen, thank you for joining us. 
Yeah, that was great. No I appreciated problem. your, your insight. Here. We might have him back next week. Maybe him and Cody. Maybe a, a four-hander. Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. Let's do it. We're sponsored by Summit Funding, Shayless Outfitters, and The Roof Doctor. Leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts if you want, or send us an email at chroniclenewsdump at gmail.com. Oh. Uh-huh.